Okay, so today we are going to talk about business plans, um, which is probably not the most fascinating topics if you don't uh, study economics, but it's pretty important uh, for every business to have an understanding of, uh, of their business and, ha and having a business plan. However, um, when I say business plan, I do not mean you know, a 100 page long document that um, people believe 20 years ago is like the foundation of your business. That's not what I'm thinking. Also, when I say a startup business plan or that a startup should have its business plan, I also don't mean um, a filled in lean Canva template. However, this is actually something that could be useful. That's why I'll divert to that for a little while. So before we jump deeper into the business plan, let me show you Lean Business Canvas uh, template. So at Berkeley, we're not huge fans of this uh, thing. However, you will find it very popular in all, all types of startup workshops, competitions, everything people will be talking about <coughs> Canvas. So that's why I thought you should know how this works. And maybe for some of you, this will be helpful to get like the big picture of what you are doing. So what is the uh, Lean Canvas? Lean Canvas is a tool that helps you to put all the key factors connected with your startup on one single sheet of paper so that you can have it in front, on, in front of you and you can see how those things are interconnected with each other. Uh, some of those things may sound familiar because we've been talking about those already and some of those we are going to talk in the future lectures. So you can see things like problem that you're solving, the way that you're solving this problem, so a solution, unique value proposition, so how your solution is different uh, from other solutions available in the market. Um, then the things like unfair advantage, so why you and your team is uniquely pos uh, positioned to be able to do that. Uh, what are the customer segments you're serving? Uh, what are the channels you're going, you're going to reach them? What are the key metrics that will uh, be used to measure your success? And also what will be the main costs uh, for this business and also the main revenue streams? So, as I said, some of you might find this useful. I don't expect any of you to use it or done it, but if you, will, if you feel that it would be good to keep things organized in your startup, uh, feel free to use it. Again, if you Google it in Canvas, you'll find dozens of templates online. Uh, some of them are just single uh, templates you can print and fill in by hand, but also there is quite a few services online where you can just fill it in uh, and have it in digital form, whatever works. Um, but again, as said, for me that's not the essence of having a business plan, uh, but some of you may find it useful, so that's why uh, I brought it up. So when I think of a business plan, I think of something that maybe to divert from the main term business plan, I think about it more of a master plan. And in the master plan, there are like three key questions that I think every startup should have an answer to. And those questions are, why am I doing this? So why do I want to do this startup? Of course, your answer may be, I'm just attending the course. But if you put this one aside, like why? Why haven't you chosen the other subject you could have instead of this one? Why haven't you decided to pick some other courses? So why am I doing this startup? That's one, uh, that's the first question. The second one is, where do I want to get? Like, what is the plan for? Like, what is, where is the, where is the goal? Where is this place where we're going with this? And then, uh, obviously, how am I going to get there? So it's like, okay, what's my motivation? What is the goal? And what is the way to that goal? Those three things are the things we are going to uh, talk about because that's those are the key elements of the way of thinking about the startup. So starting with what drives me forward, this is um, an important question in a sense that 
Mm, start doing startups is not easy. Like you've already, uh, many of you have already discovered that that you struggle with ideas, you struggle with the right team formation. Uh, then you will struggle with getting customers, traction, financing. Like it's it's often difficult, and there will, of course, there's also a lot of joy in that. But there will be difficult moments in that, and. What you have as your motivation is key so that you will be able to overcome those difficult moments and carry on instead of ditching this burning feeling like, nah, I don't want to do it anymore. So that is why it is so crucial to understand that. And it is also true that investors are really interested in that for the same reason. Because they know that there will be hard times and they know that it's really important what motivates you because this way you'll be more incentivized to carry on in the moment of doubt and what might be the answers like there are plenty of possibilities for some people that will be basically i want to get rich it's okay for some other people that will be like i really care about this particular thing um, and i really want to, to, to change the way things are in that particular case or I have some kind of personal story that makes me attached to it. Let's assume that you have a family member that suffers from some kind of orphan disease. And you're like, okay, so like I've seen him or her struggling with that for years, and now I want to change it. Um, and this happens a lot. It's like when you, when you think of your stories, plenty of them are connected with that. Like, we have in the room a um, startup that, had, that wants to improve the life of pet owners. And that's something that you can probably pretty easily relate to, saying like, yeah, I've, I have this problem too, or that's something that I feel, that's why I want to change it, for me and for other people out there. Um, we have other startup in the room that is helping with, um, let's say, better distribution of um, apartment uh, work. So who does what this week? Uh, who washes the dish dishes and who will uh, take out the garbage. Uh, again, that's, I could probably imagine that this is also based on uh, experience that you have right now and you understand like, okay, this is the problem uh, that I've experienced and I want to change that. So this is yet another source of motivation. Then, uh, except for getting rich and I really care about the cost, there is also a part of like, I really, uh, care about the people or I feel that the people I have around me were like that's something special like there's some unique potential in the team and that's actually less about the thing it's less about the outcome but it's most about with these people and this is also the kind of motivation that may drive you forward um, so it's pretty important to ask yourself that question and to find that answer. And also it's very beneficial for uh, each team to actually discuss this internally to get a better understanding of what drives you forward, because those might be different things. And again, when you will encounter a difficult moment, you may react differently to it based on what drives you to do that. Moving on, the end game. So, where do you want to get with this process? This is a question that you'll get very often from the VCs because they're interested in how you see this going forward. It's like, okay, I see that it's an interesting space, but like, what's the goal in here? Like, where do you want to be with this startup? Like, what's the, what's the plan? Uh, they will ask you. And again, there are multiple ways of, um, of doing that. The most probable answers that you will be looking for, because maybe, yeah, maybe let me give you some more context here. Um, investors, VC funds, are created for a certain limited period of time. Like the typical VC fund will be created for 10 years, which means they <coughs> gather money from their investors, they invest it in the first, let's say, one, two, three years. Um, then they keep supporting the company and probably providing some more money throughout the next, let's, like the last six years. But then at the very end, they want the comp they want to get their money back. So they want they need some kind of what we call in startup world liquidation event, 
in which they can get their money back for the shirt they purchased at the very beginning. So this could either be an IPO, so the company being listed on the stock exchange, because this way they can sell their shares on the stock exchange and get their money. Or this could be an acquisition, which means that another company will buy your company, and this way they will get money from their shares. Like those are the two most probable end games for, uh, for each startup. There are some other less probable options, but this is something institutional investors will be looking for. So if you'll be like, no, I want to do this forever, um, they will be like, no, that's not investable because how will I get out? Like, how will I be able to provide returns for my investors? Each VC will tell you. So that is why it's important to have an idea how this will happen. And especially when you think about acquisitions, it's the question like, who will be interested in acquiring a company like this? Like, who will be interested in becoming an owner of this startup? And there is a couple of things that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, first is, let's say, a so-called synergy effect. So if you do, uh, if your startup is doing something, then there is a huge chance that it shares, for example, the same customer base with uh, some other company. So they might be interested in acquiring you because mm -hmm. this way they could sell their product to your customers and your product to their customers. Uh, which is a pretty, uh, pretty obvious example. The other one is that if your startup is doing something that is already being done by someone else on another market, then you might be like, okay, so when this global company will be entering this market we're on, it will be easier for them to actually acquire us than to build their presence from start. Again, to give you an example of that, we have a team in this room that is willing to build uh, a marketplace that connects uh, people with like short time work or simple gigs to be done. Actually, I think we have two or three of them startups like this in the room. Um, and as some of you probably already know, Uber already does that in multiple markets. Like for example, in the US, it, apart from Uber as rides and Uber as eats, you'll have also Uber, uh, I think that calls charts or works or gigs, uh, where you can do things like this. Uh, easily. So <clears throat> the end game for such a startup would be like, yes, we'll build our position in, I don't know, Poland and some other markets quicker and we'll be strong enough so that when Uber will be interested in entering Poland with this product, it'll be easier for them to buy us than to actually build it from scratch. Because we'll have the user base, we'll have uh, plenty of uh, job postings every day, so this will work. This is the kind of end game uh, you might be looking for. Mm. The, uh, some other examples of, uh, or some other ways, except for the synergy effect, is like if your company will be very profitable, there might be a financial institution willing to uh, get on board, like probably private equity uh, fund, which is like the next level fund after VC funds, which starts. Uh, then there might be some companies that uh, see strategic interest in entering your space. And in that case, uh, this makes sense. Like one of the ways uh, we were pitching in Perfect Dashboard, the idea of who will, uh, or what's the end game, we said like, our ultimate goal is to get acquired by some large cloud uh, provider, because they had a huge marketplace, and this would make a perfect sense for them. So it would make sense for them to have this as a service. Actually, there are multiple companies that are being built with a very clear end game idea from the very beginning. Um, for example, there, um, uh, there are plenty of companies that have been acquired by Salesforce that have been started by former Salesforce employees. So there were people working in Salesforce um, who had an idea, but nobody in Salesforce was interested in working on that at the time, so they quit Salesforce they built their own company, and then a couple of years later, Salesforce acquired them back for a lot of money uh, to get this into the core product. And because they had a very clear idea that we built this to be acquired by Salesforce later on, they've actually chose technologies that were compatible with technologies used by Salesforce, so that you know, it was pretty easy to add the code base of this product to the main Salesforce code base, 
Um, that is why it's so critical to have like a very clear picture of who is going to acquire that, or in some other case that uh, I'm, that which it, like why a IPO makes more sense. So why going to the stock exchange uh, makes more sense than uh, than getting acquired. Mm. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be interested in your startup in a sense that you shouldn't be uh, inclined to work on that because there is a difficult balance between startup is my kid and I'm very uh, and I want to stay with it forever and then it's like no no I'm doing it only for mine to sell it five years later like you actually need to show both you should you, you need to show your passion that you're really interested in what you're doing and you, and on the other hand you need to understand that if you do business using external money <laughs> Uh, external money providers will expect you to let them get out at a certain point of the time. So you need to provide them with a vision how to do that. And it's also important for one more reason. And this reason is attracting good, attracting good employees. Because one of the ways startups uh, attract good people is not by paying them high salaries, because most startups even at later stages are not available to, are not, it's not possible for them to pay um, really good salaries, but they are able to give stock options. So they are able to give some shares to their employees and then somebody thinks like, okay, it's actually worth doing this for a slightly lower salary because those shares are going to be worth a lot of money at the exit. But again, you need to have a clear vision how and when this exit happens. Like I've actually seen companies that were forced to do an IPO mainly because their employees were willing to uh, cash their stock options. And they were like, no, we're going to quit if you don't let us uh, sell our options. Like, it's high time. We've spent enough time in here and we want to be able to get out. So that is yet another idea why it is important for the company to have a clear end game and the vision where this is all going. And when talking about end game, uh, one of the things that is being often used, one of the terms that is being often used, is so-called triple, triple, double, double. Uh, what does it mean? It means that in the first three years, you will triple your company every year. So it means 300% growth um, in every single of the three years. So if you compute that on a monthly basis, that's actually 25% monthly growth each month in the first every six months, and then that in the fourth and fifth year, you will double your company each year, um, which is basically 16% monthly growth, month on month, every single month in year four and year five. Um, so this is something you will hear a lot. And the other thing you will also hear is that it's the monthly growth rate that defines uh, a good startup down the road. Like once you have a product, once you have launched, it's actually, if, you, if you're growing at 5% a month, you're probably not going to make it. If you grow at 10% a month, well, that's okay. But if you grow at 20 and more percent a month, you are a hot startup and everyone will be fighting for a possibility to invest in you. So this is a pretty clear indication of how much traction you have. And that's how quickly the company is growing. So I've actually made a calculation for you to show you this in uh, an example. So assuming that in the initial year, so the year when you are developing the product and you've just launched, you had some early pilots and you've reached uh, one million dollar annual recurring revenue. I mean, this might sound like a lot for you at the starting point, but when, once you launch a successful product, it is not. Uh, then if you triple it in first three years, you'll get to $27 million of annual revenue. And then doubling that will get you to over $100 million of revenue um, in year plus five.